morning. Good morning. So sometimes you have funerals on Saturdays and you forget to bring your vestments back home with you. <laughs> and you have casual Sunday. So, <laughs> um, welcome to worship this morning. I have a few announcements for you. Um, first of all, regarding this new CDC regulations around masks, we and the new social distancing, we don't know how that's affecting churches just yet. The CDC hasn't been clear about that and how it works for us. So um, I just ask folks to please exercise compassion. Uh, we have people in our congregation who are either um, unable to be vaccinated or are um, especially susceptible to illnesses regarding uh, your lungs and your nervous system. So just keep that in mind. Uh, we won't be forcing you to prove that you've been vaccinated if you do choose not to wear a mask, but we just ask that you remember that. Um, we will be having a health team meeting when I come back from spiritual renewal. Um, hopefully we'll have some more information by then on how that will work with churches. Um, regarding our regular announcements though, uh, first of all, there will be a finance meeting tomorrow evening at 6.30. Um, and then I am going on spiritual renewal leave beginning tomorrow. I will be back in time for church next Sunday, but I'm just going to go take some continuing education. If there's an emergency, Pastor Susan is available to you, as well as I imagine you can probably call one of the lay leaders. I didn't ask the lay leaders that, but I'm throwing you under the bus now. So <laughs> if there's an emergency, you can contact one of our lay leaders, and I'm sure they'd be happy to help you. Um, we have the garage sale starting on Thursday, and I know that it's uh, typically my practice to come and bless the garage sale before you begin. Um, we'll bless the garage sale today uh, and during service, but the garage sale begins on Thursday at noon. We could use help if somebody's got a, even a couple free hours. Okay. They need some extra help this week, so if you have a few hours to spare, they would really appreciate that. Thanks, Sandra. Um, and then next week, we will have lunch in the park on Friday. Um, you should have received this morning a little... The 28th. The 28th, thank you. Um, the 28th from 11 to 1.30, you should have received in your pew a little half sheet of things that we need donated. If you'd like to participate in that or donate in that, uh, we ask that you fill out your sheet and then put it in with the tithes and offerings. Uh, when you leave today. Additionally, beginning on the 28th is the Chalk the Walk here at the church. Uh, we'll be doing that on Friday, Saturday, Sunday. It's come and go as you please. Uh, we'll just have chalk available for you, or if you want to bring some yourself, you're welcome to do that. Um, we're hoping to see a lot of kids come and participate, but if you're an adult and you want to participate, we would love that too. I believe that covers all of our announcements. Oh, one more. I'm sorry. I didn't write it down, but we do have one more. Next week, church will be outside for Pentecost uh, because we're also doing confirmation. And in order to have enough space for the confirmants to um, invite their friends and families, we'll have to worship outside for that. So outside church next week. Um, it'll be outside rain or shine. So please pray for sunshine and, <laughs> and uh, come and celebrate our confirmants. All right. With that, let's begin our worship.
Gracious God, as we remember you on this Ascension Festival Sunday, we ask that you would breathe life into us anew today, that we would be people of your hope and your joy, of your peace and love, now and forever. Amen. Our scripture lesson this morning comes from Luke's account of Jesus' ascension. Um, we will be reading from his account in the gospel, but we'll also be referencing his account in the book of Acts, because while he has written both of those accounts, they're slightly different. Luke chapter 24, verses 33, or 44, excuse me, through 53. Then Jesus said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. 
and he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written, that the Messiah is to suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and see, I am sending upon you what my Father promised. So stay here in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Then he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he was blessing them, he withdrew from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the temple blessing God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Hey, Dave. Dave. What? Hello. Hi. <laughs> How are you today? I didn't know it was casual Sunday. Oh, wait. It's always me. It is always <laughs> casual Sunday for you. And usually it wouldn't be casual Sunday for me, but I forgot my vestments. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so we're going to just go for it today. But since you brought that up, would you like to know why different pastors wear different things? Oh, it is a purpose. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, different pastors wear different things for lots of reasons. One of them is according to our traditions. Uh -huh. Some traditions, like the Catholic Church, uh -huh. require their pastors to wear at least a minimum number of things. Like what? Like those little white things that they wear on their shirts. Uh -huh. Those are required in the Catholic Church. Uh -huh. We call them collars. Uh -huh. They kind of look like flea collars, don't they? Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> but they're kind of like a uniform. They just let people know that you're a pastor. And even in the United Methodist Church, we can wear those. Mm -hmm. In fact, Pastor Hogan, have you met him? Nope. Pastor Hogan is the other United Methodist pastor in town. He yeah. preaches over at Zion. You're not the yeah. only one. I'm not the only one. Oh. I know. There's two United Methodist churches in town. The other one is led by Pastor Hogan, and he wears one of those. Oh. Now, I don't wear one because they, they can be. <laughs> They can be expensive, but also when I started out as a pastor, the options for female pastors to have those were pretty limited. And I didn't like the options, so I just never wore one. And then I got used to not wearing one. <laughs> the other things that we wear also depend on what kind of church we go to. So the white thing that I wear, uh -huh. usually, do you know what that's called? Mm, a bathrobe? It does kind of look like a bathrobe. <laughs> It's called an alb. Now, I don't know why it's called that. I have no idea. But do you know why I wear it? Nope. <laughs> because it's supposed to remind people of what you wear when you get baptized. Oh. Yeah, we usually wear white when we get baptized, especially if little babies will wear christening gowns. And that's a reminder of what's happening to us in baptism. We're being given grace for our sins, and we're starting a new relationship with God. So I wear that white robe every week to remind myself and the people who come to my church that we have a new relationship with God and with sin because of our baptisms. What do you think about that? Kind of bored. You're bored? <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> Is there anything else you'd like to know about pastor's clothes? You didn't want to know in the first place, I know. I can see it on your face. Why did some of you have tattoos and the others not? Why do some of us have tattoos, <laughs> tattoos and the others not? Oh, so we're Stop getting tricky. I didn't know this was happening. Okay. Well, we can go with plan B and talk about the Middle East. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> There's the laugh. <laughs> So some pastors have tattoos because they got them before they became pastors. Some pastors um, don't have tattoos at all, and that's a personal preference. Some don't have them because there's a part of our Bible that says we're not supposed to get marks on our skin. Well, what do you say? 
To the ones that do. To the ones that do or oh. don't. Like me, you mean? Yeah. <laughs> so for those of us that do have them, what we remind people of is that the marks on your skin that the Bible talks about, it's not actually talking about tattoos at all. Yeah, it's talking about something that some pagan religions did in order to mark themselves as members of that religion. So we're being asked not to do that. But we don't do that anymore. So some pastors feel like it doesn't have anything to do with tattoos. Oh, okay. Yeah, we're praying us out. What'd you say? You want to pray us out? Sure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Why don't we pray? <laughs> Dave's not having it today, folks. <laughs> Let's pray. Good and gracious God, help us to remember that we all practice our faith differently. And that's okay, because diversity is something you created. It's good, and it reminds us of all the many ways that we can connect with you. I pray today for our congregation, for Dave, for our kids in particular, that we all remember to love one another, and that we don't try and decide who is or isn't faithful, because we all understand God differently. May we love each other the way you love us. And may we support one another and give each other grace. We ask this in the name of your Son and by the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Hey, guess what? What? I can wrap that up really quickly. Moral of the story! If, you, if you're breathing, just, just come on in. We don't care. Right? That's right. Bye! <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> today. And may we be filled with hope, now and forever. Amen. So I don't know about you, but when I was a child, I would start planning weeks, sometimes months in advance regarding what I might like to have that day or do that day or how I might want to celebrate the day. I kind of drove my parents crazy with my ever-changing list. And for holidays, I would start looking for hidden Christmas presents in August. 
I had a hard time waiting. And it wasn't just for me either. Giving gifts to other people and waiting for that process was really tough. If I knew someone's birthday was coming up or when Christmas was coming up, I would start pestering that person about the gift I wanted to give them to see if they could guess it or maybe if they wanted to open it early just because I wanted to rush to get to that point. And when it came to putting gifts under the tree, I would usually start stuffing the tree in November because I thought it might ease my anxious little mind. It did not work. It made it worse. <laughs> Looking back on that now, that was probably a pretty clear sign, or should have been a pretty clear sign, that I may or may not have ADHD. Um, <laughs> but that's neither here nor there, I suppose. But in any case, my inability to wait really reminds me of this story of the Ascension. You see, Luke's gospel only gives us a summary of the larger story. If we head over to the first chapter of Acts, we'll learn that Jesus stayed with the disciples for 50 days. And then when he took them out to Bethany to ascend into heaven, he gave them some instructions. He gave them the instructions that you heard today. And then he went up into heaven. And in Acts, we find out that the disciples stood there, confused, gawking up at the sky, mouths agape for such a long time that a pair of angels had to descend back down from heaven and tell them, hey, I'm pretty sure you were given some instructions. And standing around, staring at the sky, was not one of them. Now, once the trance was broken, the disciples run back to Jerusalem, which is really only a couple hours walk from Bethany, not even that. And they went into the temple and began to worship with joy and thanksgiving as they waited for the Holy Spirit to come. And when I think about this story, as it comes around each year, I can't help but ask myself, what does it really mean to wait? We're here 2,000 years later, and we're still waiting. So what does it mean? You know, sometimes I feel like I stand around staring at the sky, waiting for something to happen. Sometimes I feel like there's something I should be doing, but I just don't know what or how to do it. Sometimes, even as a pastor, I struggle with doubt. Is it really going to happen? Or I get confused. I get tired and I get frustrated. And sometimes hope feels a little frail. And do you know what? It's okay to feel that way sometimes. I know many Christians who struggle with those same things from time to time. And typically what we like to do when we feel that way, at least I know I have this tendency, is try and brush it off and tell myself that it's not good to doubt. But it's actually kind of healthy. It's good to allow ourselves to have sad feelings. And languishing happens, and it's okay to sit with it from time to time. God is with us just as much in those moments as God is with us in any other moments of our lives. It's part of being human. But when you've had time to process, to grieve, and to rest, we have been called to do some work. Jesus gave us some instructions. And those instructions did not involve standing around doing nothing. Now in Luke's passage today, Jesus gives some instructions to his disciples that we know weren't meant for us. Certainly not 2,000 years later, living in an entirely different country under a different culture. 
But even as his instructions for them were to wait for the Holy Spirit, it doesn't change the fact that Jesus' story of his ascension is beautiful, poignant, and often neglected. In his final words, Jesus reminds his disciples and us what all of this has been about. Everything in the scriptures, he says, led up to this. It led up to my life, my death, my resurrection, and it led up to me handing it over to you as I give you an advocate to help you do the work. This is about love, Jesus says. You see, we do not become Christians and enter a relationship with God out of fear, anger, or escapism, or at least we shouldn't. And when we invite others into relationship with Jesus, it should not be about fear, anger, or escapism. It should be because of love. In love, God reached out to us to save us from ourselves, free us from all that ails and binds us, including our own sin, and empower us to be partners in God's justice and mercy. In love, God took on flesh and sanctified it. In love, God paid the ransom and brought us the victory. In love, God freely became poor. In love, God gave us an advocate to guide us in our lives and callings. This is what salvation means. And this is what Christ calls us to do. When we are guided into mission through the Holy Spirit, the goal isn't necessarily to gain the right doctrines or to proselytize the heathens. Now, I've heard some of you talk to other people about your faith, and I'm confident that you don't try to proselytize heathens. <laughs> and I'm thankful for that. But the goal is really about being like Jesus. And Jesus didn't attack others. He didn't spew hatred. He didn't name call. He healed. And he used his own life as an example of how to live in relationship with God. And so to be like Jesus, we're called to be giving, loving advocates who bring healing to this world. Who see the hurts and sanctify it. Who see the hopeless and offer hope. And in this, we find joy, just as the disciples did. And if we lead our lives this way, we too will worship without ceasing. Because being like Jesus is a sign that we're in the presence of God now and always. And you know God's presence with you today. God's love, God's grace, God's joy and hope. And may you celebrate now and forever. In response to the reading of the word, hearing of the word, excuse me, let us join together in our joys and concerns. I have a few for you today. For Di, McCulley, and Janice Johnson, we prayed for them last week, but we ask for continued prayers as they're both dealing with um, health.
health concerns. Lord, in your mercy. For the Agni family who had their funeral uh, for Joyce just yesterday. Lord, in your mercy. For Tony Banks and Mike Cervini, both who are uh, related to Peg, so prayers for Peg as well. Um, but Tony looks like his CT scan didn't offer full clearance, and so they're discerning what to do from this point. And Mike has a procedure coming up. So prayers for all three. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. And for Jerusalem and Palestine, um, the solution to this is very complicated. And we don't all agree on what to do. So I pray that as we discuss our opinions that we remember that we don't all agree and that this is a very difficult and complicated situation. But above all, we have to pray for peace. Lord, in your mercy. And continued prayers for India. Lord, in your mercy. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we come before you today celebrating the festival of the ascension of Jesus, of his call to peace, to love, and to joy. As we think on the violence in our world, particularly what's going on in Israel and Palestine, we remember that we are not living in peace, love, Enjoy. Lord, teach us to live differently. Open our eyes and our ears and our hearts to peace. Help us to live in that. We pray for those among us who are sick today, especially for Di, Janice, Tony, and Mike. We ask that you would bring them healing. May you give wisdom to their doctors. May you give clarity of mind as they decide how to move forward. may you be near to them. We pray that you would be with the, those who are ill and with their caretakers and their loved ones and friends. We pray that you would comfort your people. That you would fill them with hope, support, and rest. Give them patience and perseverance on the way. But most of all, give them healing. We pray for those among us who are grieving. Especially we pray for the Abney family, but for all who are grieving today. May you wipe the tears from their eyes. We pray for all of those on our ongoing prayer list, for those we've written on our cards today, and for those we hold before you in our hearts. Lord, speak to each according to the need. Bring forth your hope and joy. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here, both in person and online, that we would be a reflection of you now and forever, and that the love we bear would compel others to know you more. And we pray a final blessing over our upcoming garage sale. 
We ask that it would be successful. That you would provide the workers everything that they need. That you would be with us along the way. And that we would use whatever funds that we gain as a beautiful way to share our love with you. We ask this all in the name of your Son who taught us to pray, our Father, Amen. who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And forgive us from our us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. of God's love for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.